reprocess research, as Natalie already stated. And um, to start, I would like to share with you some definitions. What are we talking about when we say psychotherapy process research? And I hope after my presentation, we can have a dialogue and with questions, answers, comments, and so on. I took this uh, short definition. Um, it states that the psychotherapy process research is the study of the content of psychological therapy sessions and the mechanisms through which client change is achieved, both in single sessions and across time. And here we have the main focus of process research. It is on change mechanisms. And we also have two categories, uh, studies that focus on sessions or even on episodes within sessions, and also other studies that focus on the whole therapy. The main questions of psychotherapy process research are very simple. What changes in psychotherapy and how does change occur? But these um, simple questions take a lot of uh, difficulties, have a lot of difficulties on the methodological level, as you will see. The aims of psychotherapy process research are the following. Uh, we want to understand the mechanisms of the treatment processes and change processes to understand which aspects of treatment are the most important for change, but also to contribute to the development of theories, to assist in the development of effective training, and obviously to inform clinical practice. We can distinguish some units of analysis. So I already mentioned this, is some of the studies address the full therapy, and I will call them macro process studies and others, sessions, segments, and specific events. And those I will call micro process um, studies together with Carolina Altini, we published on this on 2016. Some words to the history of psychotherapy uh, process research. It really started in the 50s with Carl Rogers, but it has a huge revival in the 80s with Rainer Bastine in Germany and with Robert Elliott as well. And this revival has to do with the results of outcome studies, the previous results of outcome studies that, as everybody here knows, brought us to a point where we couldn't distinguish anymore about um, re regarding the efficacy of different approaches. And that's what we know as the Dodebert's verdict. And as a reaction to this, um, many colleagues, SPR colleagues, stated that if we focus only on the results of the comparison of approaches and don't add knowledge about why psychotherapy is effective, we will not reach the point. We will not know why it is effective. And since then, a long and very active tradition of process research developed. We need to distinguish different levels in process research. And as you will see in the specific studies, uh, usually they mix levels. They don't, they don't focus only on one of these levels. So this is a slide from Carolina Altinir as well. We can distinguish speaking terms, episodes, sessions, and phases of therapy. And on speaking terms, we could for example, study facial behavior or speech content. On the level of the episode, we could study ruptures or change episodes. At the session levels, we can see patterns, we can evaluate the alliance, we can evaluate session outcome or session quality. And on the whole therapy, usually studies distinguish between initial, middle and final phases. I would uh, now like to share with you what we have been uh, studying in the Chilean uh, research program, because we have been moving around these different levels. 
our trajectory started in 1992 with the study of change from the perspective of clients and therapists. And then we developed a model of change. We continued for many years doing this. And in 2003, we added observational studies and we developed what we call the generic change indicators. Afterwards, 2005, we went into the micro process and started change episodes and stuck episodes. And then we added the study of the therapeutic communication with the therapeutic activity coding system. We developed this system, uh, we called it TAX. And then 2009, we added the study of nonverbal therapeutic communication. Afterwards, the mutual regulation between patient and therapist. And then 2015, we added mentalization episodes. And then the same year, we went back to qualitative studies about the experience of success and failure in psychotherapy from the perspective of the participants. And now our group is much bigger now, ha has much many more members. So we are doing more or less all these at the same time. And now I would like to come to a systematic review of the last decade. 2009 to 2019 about psychotherapy process research. Here I work together very closely with Mahaida Reiner, so I need to uh, acknowledge this. And the first question is why spend so much resources time on a systematic review? And what we wanted to achieve is uh, to to leave behind us this observation from 15 years ago, that there is still a small number of clear cut and robust research findings. That was a statement David Olinsky made in 2004. And so what we wanted to do is to accumulate knowledge. We didn't do a traditional systematic review because we sampled journals. So we selected eight journals and within these journals, we uh, looked at all, all publications. The selected journals are four international journals with high impact factor, as you can see, and four Latin American journals with much lower impact factors as all our journals, but within our subcontinent, they are a very known, well-known journals. And within these journals, we included all studies addressing any characteristics of patient therapists or therapeutic relationship or interventions that were measured during the process, regardless of whether input variables or final outcome were assessed or not. And we included all methodological approaches. What we excluded were studies only assessing input or outcome variables without addressing the process in between. And we, there were a couple of papers only illustrating methodological approaches and we excluded them as well. If you look at the, we all together, we looked at 3,784 papers and we selected 191. And if you see most of them, uh, of the selected papers here in red, belong to psychotherapy research. In second place, the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology. And some of them belong to the Argentine Journal of Clinical Psychology. Sorry. <laughs> And if you look at the countries of the first author, you can see that almost half of the papers belong to authors from the United States, but in second place from Chile, then Portugal, Canada, and so on. It's interesting to look at the methodology as well. You can see that um, most of the studies are quantitative. But we also have an um, interesting amount of qualitative studies. 
mostly in, the, in our journal, Psychotherapy Research, but also in the Latin American journals. And we have also studies with mixed methods. If we look at the frequency of type of studies, um, in, in this category, macro process, those that address the whole therapy, but without looking at outcome that might sound a bit strange to you. Here, mostly we have um, single case studies. And then we can look at the macro process outcome studies. There we have plenty of them, 91 on micro process outcome, 61, and those studies that only address the micro process without looking at the outcome. And now I would like to look with you at the foci of these studies, the macro process studies, these 13 studies. They mostly look at the therapeutic relation and in, oh no, in first place at the therapeutic strategy and then in second place on the therapeutic relation. If we look at macro process outcome studies, we see that most of them address ongoing change. In second place, the therapeutic relation. In third place, therapeutic strategy. Micro process studies, the pure micro process studies, address different issues. Therapeutic communication, difficult episodes, the therapeutic relation, change episodes. And those studies that address microprocess and outcome focus on change episodes, therapeutic communication, and difficult episodes, mostly. My intention with this is to give you an overview about these studies, but now I want to go into the results of the studies. And first of all, telling you that what we performed was a type of in qualitative meta-analysis because the approaches, the methodological approaches of these studies are so different that it is impossible to do a traditional meta-analysis, um, obviously. So this was a qualitative uh, meta-analysis. And I would like to answer these, the question about what we have learned in these 10 years. Macro process studies uh, show us results in these seven different categories. And I would like to go one by one. Regarding evolution of change, the first thing these studies tell us is that change indeed evolves throughout the process. I mean, you will say obvious, but we have data. But they also show us that the process is irregular but progressive. And more important than this, they show that the evolution of ongoing changes predict outcome and adherence. And that also the agreement between client and therapist is very important uh, for positive outcome. And there is some contradictory evidence regarding if patterns or slopes of change differ or not according to types of treatments and to patient characteristics. And here are some of the several references we have about this topic. Regarding content of change with the question, what changes through psychotherapy? The main changes across studies are the construction of new meanings, new views of oneself, the changes in relational patterns, the increased flexibility in new self-narratives, the integration of different positions of self or voices, okay? the change in emotional responses and patterns, symptomatic change, and well-being. And here are some references about this. And which are the facilitators and obstacles for therapeutic change? The first very important thing to say is the, that the effect of process variables differs across treatment phases. So what 
works for outcome in early phases is not exactly the same that works for outcome in later phases. And then we cannot say that there are some techniques, for example, that are very important for outcome across treatments because it will depend on the phases. And it also will depend on how we measure outcome. And this is interesting. If we address outcome, looking at symptoms, Maybe we will find some techniques or some communication ingredients that are important. But it, if we look at another type of outcome, for example, social functioning, we will find other uh, techniques as important. And this makes life uh, for researchers very difficult. What we also found across studies is that the quality of the delivery of treatment tasks is more important than the approach of theoretical underpinnings. And it's also important that the therapists feel comfortable with what they are doing. What attitudes, therapists' attitudes are helpful? Here are the three main attitudes and actions we found. Strengthen patients' autonomy and recognizing their individuality, making their experiences understandable and meaningful, facilitating the expression of emotions. These three ingredients are very important. And looking at patients, what is important is their adherence to the specific therapy framework. Also, uh, patients have to adhere to the approach and the degree of engagement in therapy, their emotional processing, and the application of the new understandings or learnings from therapy to daily life and to other problems. Obstacles. I, we didn't find many therapist obstacles because there are, not, there are not so many studies about that. We found more client obstacles. And here are three very important of them. Attachment, attachment anxiety, disengagement, and resistance to change. And here again, the references. And relevant episodes. We can, could call them all change episodes because they are about change, but they have different names in the literature. So we can find change moments, innovative moments, moments of connecting, uh, this is the therapeutic cycle model, or emotion work episodes. And all these uh, types of episodes related to change are part of these macro process studies. So their frequency or appearance or how they develop or evolve is related to outcome and the whole process. And what we found is that the frequency of these uh, relevant episodes is very important for outcome. Here are some references. And another type of relevant episodes that we find uh, in the literature is the so are the studies about ruptures and other difficult episodes, but mostly about ruptures. And what they show us is that the frequency of ruptures does not predict poor outcome, but the lack of resolution does. And also specific uh, studies on innovative moments show us that when you have an innovative moment, this is a type of change episode evolving, but it doesn't come to an end and it returns to the problem. This is related to poor outcome. And now I'm coming to the therapeutic alliance. We know a lot about therapeutic alliance. We have known for decades now that the quality of the alliance predicts ongoing change and final outcome. And the last decade gives us very strong evidence in this same direction. It shows us also that alliance improves over time in good outcome therapies that early alliance is very important. It predicts, even the first session predicts outcome, and that if early alliance is low, it can predict, can be related to termination. 
Alliance and ongoing change correlate, of course, and patients uh, are continue rating their alliance uh, po more positively than their therapists. And uh, usually there is a temporary congruence between therapists and patients and good outcome therapies. But what is newer? It is the research on causality and the relation of alliance and symptomatic change. And there we find that alliance temporarily precedes a symptomatic change. So we find that session to session changes in the alliance predict subsequent session to session changes in symptoms. And also what we found is that growth uh, curves are important for outcome. And maybe it is a key mechanism that client perceived change uh, may be, um, uh, sorry, the continual development of the alliance may be a key mechanism in the Kind of perceived change. But also there is some evidence showing us that the growth curves in the alliance seem to be independent from the therapeutic approach, but this, there are some studies that go in this direction and us not really. Other findings regarding the alliance show us that alliance contributes positively to emotional processing, that the impact of alliance and outcome, these are the other studies, can depend on the therapeutic approach, that the relation of alliance and outcome varies according to the disorder and interpersonal functioning, and that the agreement of patients and therapists regarding the alliance impacts change and outcome. What factors facilitate the alliance? Secure attachment in both patients and therapists. So anxious attachment impacts the alliance negatively. Therapists immediacy is also important, but not in all phases of therapy. It is more important in later phases than in earlier phases. Also a facilitating factor is the therapist allowing mutuality and emotional closeness. And in less severe cases, Unfortunately, I have to say the relation between alliance and outcome is stronger than in severe cases. Here again, some references. And what about therapeutic techniques? The frequency of studies on therapeutic techniques is still low, too low. But in singular studies, we find that some specific techniques can be related to outcome, positive outcome. But in general, I would make the following statement that the combination of challenging interventions together with supportive interventions, recognizing the specific state of development of the patient might be the best. And here again, references. And regarding therapeutic communication, the communication between patients and therapists changes throughout the whole process. But having stated this, uh, we can also make a statement about a verbalization of emotions and say that unpleasant emotions increase in middle phases and decrease in final phases of therapy. And that both verbal as well as nonverbal interaction is linked to outcome that therapist responsiveness facilitates clients' reflexivity and that mentalizing verbalizations relate to outcome. All these findings are across several studies. Here's some references. Now I'm coming to the results of microprocess studies. Remember that microprocess studies address um, therapy sessions or episodes or even speaking turns or smaller units. And here we found four relevant categories in our qualitative meta-analysis. Change events. I already talked about change events and macro process studies. Those, these are more or less the ch same change events, but these studies address the immediate consequences of these events. 
And we have some events I didn't mention before that are mostly studied in these microprocess uh, studies. For example, events of relational death, sudden gains or moments of emotional processing. Some immediate effects of these change events. What do they produce? They produce in the patient reconceptualization, new self narratives, new experiences, effective emotional processing, new awareness, sense of agency, and of course, the improvement of symptoms and coping skills, but measured at session level. References. And other studies focus on ruptures in micro, in the micro process. Ruptures and other difficult episodes. So we find uh, most studies are on ruptures, but we also find some studies on episodes on, on, of ambivalence, disaffiliation episodes, hostile interpersonal episodes or stuck episodes. But I will tell some results about studies on ruptures. They show us that resolution is very important for the evolution of alliance within sessions, for example, or next sessions and ongoing change. And that the agreement of patient and therapists regarding the ruptures impacts alliance positively. And this is very important for clinicians that the progress toward resolution is influenced by the therapist's recognition of the rupture reflecting on the therapeutic relationship, reflecting about the therapist's expectations. If therapists change their approach to explore the salient issue for the client, this is important for resolution. And results also show us that if resolution is not complete in withdrawal ruptures, these can evolve into confrontation ruptures or over compliance. And what about the evolution of the, um, therapeutic relationship alliance and ongoing change? These microprocess studies show us that the perceptions of relational connection between client and therapists are associated, that the feelings of connection increase over time usually, that Clients increase their feelings of connection with less anxious therapists and that the improvements in patients' reports of the Alliance predict session outcome. And in fourth place, what about verbal communication? First of all, um, the results across studies tell us that Verbal communication distinguishes clearly the different roles. For example, therapists ask more and interpret more, patients answer and agree more. But more important than this, studies show us that therapists' verbalizations influence patients' verbalizations. So they produce, for example, therapists' verbaliza verbalizations produce clients' verbalizations that show us a change in meaning. They produce more references to oneself and the client, and also higher levels of emotional experiencing. And now I'm coming to the discussion. And afterwards, I hope to receive some questions and comments. But first of all, um, these studies show us that psychotherapy process research uses a huge variety of qualitative and quantitative methods and very often innovating through new methodologies. And the study designs are uh, frequently combine the different methods for data collection and include questionnaires, interviews with patients and therapists and observation. And primary data are very often obtained in natural settings. And this means that therapy is usually uh, recorded. 
and these raw data are coded through devices and manuals we have I think hundreds in the world specifically created for the classification and further analysis of both visual and verbal data. And what have we learned from our results in summary? Macro process studies show us that ongoing changes related to outcome, that the main contents of ongoing change are new meanings and progressive psychological integration, that the quality of the alliance predicts ongoing change and final outcome, and that a good alliance temporarily precedes symptomatic change and that different phases need different techniques. And on the microprocess level, change episodes and moments impact ongoing change, that unrepaired ruptures predict poor outcome and the therapist verbalizations influence patients' verbalizations. And the results also show us that macro and micro processes are interrelated. The changes, micro process changes, obviously impact also macro process changes. And here the frequency and the type of the little bit small change events is important. What about effective therapies? I like to show this quote from Peter Muntigel and Adam Horvath because it summarizes the findings of our systematic review. It says, effective therapists manage to closely affiliate and collaborate with their clients to engage in conversations that extend the client's horizons, create new, more viable ways to view themselves, and engage with the world. And we also found some sequences in these process results, interesting sequences between, for example, alliance, ongoing change and outcome, and also emotional work leading to change of meanings and this leading to well-being. Some limitations, we didn't sample all journals. As you know, we took a sample from of eight journals. And if one takes uh, publications, it's impossible to avoid uh, the publication bias. So we know more about effective, um, for example, interventions than non-effective. And our qualitative analysis of results combines studies with different methodological approaches. So there might be an overgeneralization. And therefore, our results have more the status of hypotheses that need to be tested in um, future studies. And some general limitations of the field, our knowledge uh, is still very fragmented. Also because of what I just said, that we have very different methodological approaches. So uh, the robust and replicated results are still few. And the field of alliance research is the only one where it is it has been possible to perform meta-analysis that clearly establish the impact on final outcome. So my final thoughts are psychotherapy process research is a powerful tool for uncovering change mechanisms, but in future studies, these change mechanisms have to be related to ongoing change in order to tell us something. And therefore we need some, we need models of change. And the one question here is to what extent these models um, should be generic, like uh, models that are go um, beyond a specific therapeutic approach. And ongoing change in the future studies has to be related to outcome as well. Um, and we need uh, complex designs to study change mechanisms longitudinal designs with mixed methods, including different perspectives. 
And we also need to um, look at different types of episodes. When we study change mechanisms, we need to distinguish between episodes. And results can be very multidimensional. Uh, addressing interpersonal aspects, subjective meaning, verbal and nonverbal communication, physiological variables, and so on. My own ideas for future research, I'm very interested in actions. This means therapeutic interventions. And I'm very interested in looking at how they uh, relate to client engagement, therapeutic alliance, therapists immediacy and also to um, some results or intermediate outcomes like client feeling understood or later results like the patient or client seeing him or herself differently, feeling differently, engaging in new behavior and symptom reduction. And finally, I would like to thank the whole Latin American network for psychotherapy process research. As you can see, here are we, this um, integrated by nine different colleagues from nine different countries. Here you can get to know them a bit with their pictures. So I want to thank all of them. We have been working for years and will continue doing so. And thank you for listening to me. I'm sure there would be a, a round of applause at this point. There we go. We can see some clapping hands. Um, in, the virtual realm. And so we did have one uh, request come in from Elena to pull back up, if possible, the slide with um, discussion on macro and micro process. Okay. It sounds like that was maybe towards the beginning. Okay, let me go back then. Ooh, wait. <laughs> it's not working as I expected to. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're nice this is you. not the, the, the quick way to do it. <laughs> In the meantime, yeah. folks feel free. This to... one. <laughs> ah, yes. That should be. Wonderful. And so maybe that's to spark an additional question, but um, in the meantime, if anyone has questions, do feel free to raise your hand or type them in the chat. Um, I certainly you know, learned a lot and it's really wonderful to hear such a nice summary from um, someone who's been in this field a long time. I myself am still in the training phase, very early career um, uh, in clinical psychology. And something that stuck out to me, definitely from the, the points on therapist effectiveness and what makes a good therapist across the studies is that these factors seem to be facilitative, and at least from my experience, not emphasized in training programs. Um, and I wonder, you know, if there are any thoughts you have about how we might begin to integrate those in a more systematic and formal way. Yes. I mean, maybe training varies a lot uh, in different countries, I mean, among countries, but if I look at the experience we have here in my country, for example, um, I would say that there are sometimes there is an overemphasis on techniques mm -hmm. and um, the therapeutic relation should be uh, more in, 
on the focus for training as well. But this means many things. This means the therapist has to know him or herself much better, has to know, for example, uh, how they attach to other people, have to learn about the, or their own emotional expression. What we found in these studies is that emotional processing is very important. And emotional processing depends also on how the therapist relates to his or her own emotions. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to work much more with the therapist as the, how do you say, as the instrument for change, no? Mm -hmm. A therapist has to be very attuned to the patient and to the relationship. And so this is very important, more than the techniques. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Let's see. I haven't seen any additional questions pop into the chat or anybody raising their hands it's a lot of information to know what to do with i'm sure people are just <laughs> integrating all of that but um maybe i don't know for me it was very interesting to see these results about the different faces in therapy and that different faces have different uh, change mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And this is a real challenge for research because um, what we cannot uh, find, I, I think after this review and after my own studies is the important group of, uh, for example, facilitating factors or for example, interventions. If we look at interventions, what is something I am very interested in, we have to very carefully um, look at faces, look at patients' characteristics, therapist characteristics. So it, I think it will be impossible to reach general statements, like right. what, what is the typical effective therapy? That's something <laughs> I, I think we need to leave in the past. But I would love to hear your comments about this. Chris Evans uh, raised his hand. Here we go. I'll go ahead and ask him to unmute. Um, I feel very embarrassed um, unmuting myself. Um, that was brilliant. Um, absolutely brilliant and I think probably there are many people with lots of ideas um, that we're all digesting. I completely agree with what you say just now Marianne it, it, and I worry that if I think about those journals I think so much of the other papers to some extent are still pursuing that kind of, it seems to me, completely mad idea about general ideas and general outcomes. And I, I really wonder how we, how we start to move on from there. I think mm. your review is a great help. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm sort of just throwing a, another huge question into the mix. But thanks very, very much. Um, and I hope other people will follow my lead. <laughs> and we do have folks popping questions into the chat now. Um, Andre was asking, were there any studies looking particularly at what type of therapeutic relationship works for specific cases. Um, so kind of getting at this, this zoning in on particular instances when a, a therapeutic relationship would be most helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, first of all, I would like to react to Chris's uh, comment. Um, yes, um, I also think we need to 
like to rethink what we really want to achieve in the future of psychotherapy process research and not to forget by doing this that what we want um, to achieve finally is to have more knowledge of course but also to impact clinical practice so in this sense, I think um, the approach of psychotherapy process research is the correct one because it usually looks at therapies in natural contexts. But the, the idea, and you stated this as well, of trying to get to this uh, really general results is it's not, uh, it's, it's not going to, to work, I think. And so, I, Unfortunately, I think we will have to continue collecting specific results that are relevant for specific cases, for, and this leads me to the next questions, for specific um, contextual conditions, the specific uh, client characteristics, therapist characteristics, and so on. And um, yeah, and we'll, probably never reach these uh, overlapping general results. And uh, now coming to the question about the alliance, um, what we know is that it is much more difficult to reach um, a good alliance when cases are severe, with severe cases. So probably, I mean, I'm inferring this, but probably it needs other techniques to establish a good alliance with severe cases. and. I have been closer in, to, in, in the last years to research on borderline disorders um, with adolescents. And um, there are some techniques that are really good for lines, but again, these are specific techniques in a specific approach for these adolescents. And I'm, I'm specifically talking now about adolescent, adolescent identity treatment, but there are other techniques from, from other approaches as well. Um, um, I mean, what we know in general is that alliance is important for all therapeutic approaches. There's no approach where you can say here, alliance doesn't matter. But um, it has to be, shaped uh, in relation to patient characteristics. The, that is what I, what I would say. And it needs longer. If patients are, have a severe disorder, it needs longer. And you will need, for example, a more supportive relationship in, in the first sessions and, uh, and not so much oriented to, for example, produce change moments. And afterwards you can go on with the change moments. Wonderful. And then I had a question that was um, so sent directly to me about um, the fact that oftentimes when therapies are you know, studied in more controlled environments, um, they tend to be more limited in time um, than, than a standard course of therapy that we might see in the community. Um, and kind of wondering about how that might affect the results found in various of these studies and across the um, results you summarized. Okay. Yes, this is an important question. Uh, therapies, I mean, there are several studies, many studies, and in, let's say, artificial uh, contexts and research contexts, and those therapies are not uh, exactly the same than the therapies occurring in natural settings, because usually um, disorders are less severe. Very often therapists are novel therapies or therapists in training. And as you already stated in the question, the, these therapies are not, not always, but very often are shorter. But I think the most important factor is that um, in those studies, we try to reach um, the similarity of the 
of patient characteristics of the delivery of therapy. And therefore we narrow down the natural scope of psychotherapy. So for sure, but I would say we need both. We need studies that we perform in natural context that show us more the variety of these um, of therapist variables, client variables, and the processes. But for testing specific hypotheses, we also need these artificial contexts. They give us different types of results. We have, if we perform both as we do in psychotherapy research, we will reach uh, better results, more robust results. And let's see, there's another question in here from Elena, um, who says, some therapists say that sessions over the internet don't allow us to study symptoms um, in much depth because presence in, a, in the room, I assume, um, can give you more clues and mm. thoughts on that. Yes, this, this is a nice question for me because together with other Latin American colleagues, we have been studying internet therapies for, for a while. It's still an ongoing research. And um, comparing it uh, to, um, to therapies like the class in, in the classic setting, I would say you lose clues, but you gain others. This is what our results tell us. You lose some of the nonverbal um, activity, things you cannot see, but you gain insight into the daily life context of your patients. This is something patients as well as therapists have um, told us an interview we have performed with in this study. The study has a quantitative and a qualitative part. This interview is from the qualitative part. So they, they gain insight. And this insight in, into the natural context of the patient is also important for therapy. And we found another very interesting result that the, uh, how to formulate this, the, the relationship you can establish with the patient because the patient also uh, gets insight into the part of the daily life of the therapist because these therapies are performed from the rooms like now I'm sitting in my room and for example and so it there it um, how to say it the status difference between therapists and patients is less in these contexts, internet contexts. And this is something we also have observed in other settings, in teaching settings, for example. And therapists, for example, tell us that they shared with their parents sometimes this difficulty. We all are in this pandemic context. We all have to perform our activities through internet. So they have a shared context they didn't have before. And this is good for the therapeutic relationship. So you lose and you gain. That's really interesting. I haven't thought about the, uh, the leveling the playing field so much yes. of, of our contexts. Um, Let's see, do you, do you have access to the chat um, to see it? Yes, I do. A, a, I do. A nice long comment. Um, oh yes, it's a, a longer comment. Put in here. Um. One question, I, I'm reading the comment. Yep. Uh, one question, what, what is meant by therapists' helpful attitudes and actions? Uh, making their experience, oh yes, maybe the slide uh, had less words than it needed. It, making the patient's experiences understandable and meaningful. 
that, that would be an attitude and helpful attitude from the therapist towards the patient. Because it is, I mean, maybe it's also important for the therapist that his own uh, behavior is understandable, but in the therapeutic setting, it, part of the role of the therapist and that is helpful for change is um, that he or she mediates between uh, some experiences uh, of of the client and the meaning these experiences have for him or her. That's what I meant. Welcome. <laughs> I have another question if we don't have any in the chat right now. Um, one thing that also stood out to me across some of the results is the repeated importance of agreement between client and therapist, whether there was agreement on, you know, whether change was happening, the kind of change that was taking place or the quality of the relationship. Um, and I wonder in, in two parts, whether that's assessed you know, by asking directly, do you think you agree with, or do you think there's agreement between you, um, or by you know re results on the similar measure? Um, so do their do their responses to some questionnaire line up, um, or is their agreement assessed in a more you know, systematic way? No, no. Usually, it is uh, on the measure level. Mm. For example, you take the WAI and you have the patient format and the therapist format, and then you can look uh, from the research perspective on the agreement. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of agreement. Is, is, yes. In some studies, we have, uh, I've seen interviews, and then you can, but you interview a patient and therapist separately. So you can ask, for example, the therapist about significant events and you ask the patient about significant events mm -hmm. and then you put the this information together and you can see the level of agreement mm -hmm. and this level of agreement and this is important what you noted because it 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 impacts um outcome but i think it's just it, it's a proxy it's it's just the um, the visible uh, part of something more profound Mm -hmm. And this something more profound is the attunement between the therapist and the patient. So it can be visible on the alliance level, or it can be visible because they both perceive the changes, mm -hmm. but it is about how, how connected they are. Yeah. It's a big part of the alliance itself. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, let's yeah. see. I haven't seen any new hands or questions. Um, so I'll give folks maybe another minute or two, but mm -hmm. then we can head off to integrate all of this information. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, well, you know, like I mentioned um, earlier, oh, uh -oh. last minute hand. All right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ask you to unmute yourself to ask your question. Yeah. Hi. I didn't have time to write it down. So I just ask. Uh, it doesn't uh, give me peace, <laughs> this answer. And now I recognize what's my uh, question about therapists. Are there any, um, uh, or how much there is uh, this research about uh, how important it is for therapists to be in our own um, therapy processes, you know, um, have our own um, uh, support 
by personal therapist or, or personal, I don't know, maybe even supervision. Uh, is this uh, also uh, here in this research? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, sorry for my bad, bad English. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for my bad English as well. So, <laughs> no, look, in, in, there is not one study among this 191 studies we, we included in the systematic review. There is no study about the importance of the therapist's own therapy process, but probably because uh, all these studies are about a psychotherapy process. So they don't look uh, only at therapist variables. Uh, if they include therapist variables, it's, it, it, it's not the main focus. Um, the only thing I could say is what I answered. I mean, it, it gets a bit closer to your question, but it doesn't answer it directly, is that when there, when there was another question asking me about the therapeutic relationship, I said um, it's important for the therapist to know him or herself and to know, for example, his or her attachment styles, because those attachment styles impact uh, therapy. Our results show us they, they are important. And uh, they show us also that an anxious attachment style from the therapist is not a good ingredient for outcome. Therefore, I could conclude, adding some ideas to, to your question, is that maybe it would be very important for other therapists' um, effect, efficacy to work on their attachment styles for example and that is something you can do in a therapy wonderful um, well before we close out um just wanted to remind everybody that uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted um, to our SPR website, which I'll pop into the chat here. Um, and you can also find there the dates and topics for upcoming webinars. And we'd really love to see everybody um, continue to come back. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Krauss, for this presentation. I think the, the general consensus is it's been incredibly enlightening um, and um, gives, gives us all a lot to think about. <laughs> thank you very much, Natalie, for organizing. And thank everybody for listening and for the interesting questions at the end. Yes, they make me think a lot also how to continue doing research. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you've got lots of thanks coming back your way through the chat. <laughs> um, wonderful. All right. Well, hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. And we'll go ahead and close out. Mm -hmm. Bye. <laughs>